So each patient will have a given baseline risk of perioperative myocardial ischemia depending on his coronary circulation and monitoring should be dictated if such event is anticipated. So the first and foremost thing for this question of myocardial infarction intraoperatively in a non-cardiac surgery, the patients can fall under two categories. Patients with existing coronary artery disease, patients with no previous history of or suggestive of coronary artery disease. So this is what is called the baseline risk of preoperative myocardial ischemia. Depends on his coronary circulation. And you must, if it's a known coronary artery disease, you will be more alert. You will know that he's likely to, he's a potential candidate where he can go in for this problem and you will be preparing yourself and keeping everything ready. On the contrary, a patient, say a 65-year-old man, non-hypertensive, non-diabetic, no, is the Mets is seven Mets, he plays tennis every week, and he not uh, had any chest pain, no history of previous angina or any suggestion of a coronary artery disease. And that patient suddenly intraoperatively develops an ischemia, then you are in trouble. You, because you are more confident that he is a very healthy person and you take him up for surgery and intraoperatively something goes wrong, you are caught unaware. That is where the crisis situation comes. So this is, this is the first thing that you have to say. So what are all the methods of detecting intraoperative ischemia? All your evaluation preoperatively with your uh, ASA uh, the guidelines of um, uh, mild, moderate, severe, or least revised cardiac index, all will fit into patients with known coronary artery disease coming for non-cardiac surgery, where infarction may happen or may not happen. So it is only a preoperative evaluation. But the question that has been asked here is the diagnosis and management of myocardial infarction intraoperatively, intraop myocardial infarction. So first thing, you have to classify the patient with a potential risk for MI and a patient with no uh, potential causes for MI. That is the classification. Whatever be the type of patient, what are all the methods of intraoperative ischemia or uh, infarction that can be detected is first and foremost is ECG. That is the most important method of diagnosing the ischemia or infarction happening intraoperatively. And there, what you have described as how to detect whether it's a right coronary artery disease, left coronary artery disease, all the ECG changes that can be done. <clears throat> but normally, we use only a three lead ECG with the standard lead two as a regular monitoring device. But when you think that there's a possibility of myocardial ischemia and infarction, lead two and V5 having 80% sensitivity. And leads to V4 and 3 have a 96% sensitivity. So you must have a 5 lead ECG, which can give additional information, not only with the standard lead 2, which we always use, but in addition, you must have the additional methods of monitoring. And there is a, um, another configuration called CM5 configuration. Are you aware of it, uh, Dr. Tina? How is CM5 configuration done? No, sir. Are you, huh? Have you heard of this CM5 configuration? Uh, no, sir. No. Okay. So this is done like this. See, normally you put a right arm lead, you put a left arm lead, and you put a, a left leg lead. Whereas for a CM5, it's called central manubrium V5 position. That is the expansion of the CM5. So you shift the right arm lead to the manubrium sternae. You keep the left arm lead at the V5 position, which you normally do for unipolar chest leads. And you keep the indifferent lead on the left shoulder. So if you do this, this gives a more accurate picture of including subendocardial ischemia. It need not be always a major coronary block like a right or left coronary block, it can produce even subendocardial ischemia, which can be detected by the CM5 configuration. 
so the first and foremost answer that is expected for a question like this where intraoperative infarction in a non cardiac surgery is how you place the electrocardiogram leads the second thing is blood pressure measurement always you may have a tachycardia and a low blood pressure or you may have a bradycardia and low blood pressure when will you have a tachycardia and a low blood pressure and when will you have a bradycardia and low blood pressure Does that give any clue? India, Russia, Nobika, and Hypo Vita. Hypovolemia. Hypovolemia can produce tachycardia and hypotension, but with regard to coronary, you know, we are now talking about myocardial ischemia and infarction. Which coronary block will produce tachycardia and hypotension? Which coronary block will produce bradycardia and hypotension? Left coronary. Right coronary block. Ah. Will Right coronary because it supplies the SA node it will be accompanied by bradycardia and hypotension. On the contrary, LAD left coronary block will be always tachycardia and hypotension. So blood pressure measurement, accurate measurement, timely treatment of hypotension is important in those with myocardial ischemia. Arterial line placement indicated in susceptible cases as it gives real time blood pressure measurement. So if a patient Coming for non cardiac surgery, first you classify them into patients with existing coronary artery disease, patients with no previous coronary artery disease. If the patient is a known coronary artery disease and he comes for a major surgery, you go for an arterial line placement at the beginning itself. On the contrary, a patient with a no existing history of coronary artery disease, you go for non invasive blood pressure as you do in a routine cases. Then the third thing is, if you have facilities for transesophageal echocardiography, that will give you a very good idea about the, what is the thing you can get from transesophageal echocardiography if there is an on-table in myocardial infarction. Regional wall motion abnormality. Regional wall motion abnormality. Fantastic. So that is how you detect the intraoperative myocardial infarction by regional wall motion abnormality through transesophageal echocardia because majority of the time we may not be able to do a transthoracic echocardiography. So the third method to detect is this transesophageal echocardiography. Then fourth method is to we put in a pulmonary artery catheter. If a high risk case, as you said, patient known existing already had a one infarct and has been treated medically, Yes, uh, is coming for a major uh, abdominal procedure. Then it is better to go for an invasive line with the pulmonary artery catheter. But it is not commonly recommended because of the complication rates associated with that. Then biomarkers. If intraoperative <coughs> ischemia or infarction is suspected, then you take a blood sample and send for biomarkers and do serial testing because biomarkers will not become positive immediately after you suspect or you see a ECU change. It may take uh, one to two hours to get the markers rising. So it is uh, always better to do a serial testing of the proponents and also <coughs> the draw CAT. And I think, uh, Dr. Tina, you mentioned the NT, BNT values in milligrams. But if I remember correct, it is in nanograms. I don't think it is in milligram. Please check it up again. And uh, so that is all how you detect the intraoperative uh, myocardial infarction. Then management of intraoperative MI, prompt recognition of possible by electrocardiography with HP segment uh, changes, conduction changes, or a new onset LBB, altered hemodynamic, persistent hypotension, tachycardia, or bradyarrhythmia, changes in biomarkers, or new changes in imaging and wall motion, or sometimes even cardiac arrest could have happened because of the acute infarction. <clears throat> now, optimization of myocardial perfusion by maintaining balance between oxygen supply and demand is very, very important to prevent further enlargement of the infarction. And minimizing secondary stress like emergence extubation intraoperative tachycardia, arrhythmia, hypothermia, hypoxia, acidosis, all these things will be to reduce the demand. And maintenance of coronary perfusion pressure 
if necessary with a good dietic diastolic blood pressure by he challenge or use of vasopressor or sometimes we may be used to be using a intraartic balloon pump also correction of metabolic abnormalities in anemia maintenance of myocardial oxygen delivery as a function of ppp and oxygen content of the blood the correction of anemia and index of coronary artery dilator reduction of uh, demand by correction of dysrhythmias use of nitroglycerin for improved supply and invasive intraartic balloon pump for extra corporeal membrane oxygen for cardiogenic shock and prompt conclusion of surgical procedure in a safe manner and consultation for cardiology for continued post operative management like percutaneous intervention or uh, immediate sometimes cabg also okay so this is what is expected out for this question rather than talking about complete evaluation with the <clears throat> various scoring systems and all those things so this is a little tricky question which you have to think in terms of answering like this and then make a answer for this okay so i think this will be the way the answer is expected for this particular question that has been asked okay